Well, in the interest of time, because we have a number of presenters today, I'm going to go ahead with the introduction to this panel. Uh, it's, my name is Martin Halbert. I'm the uh, NSF Science Advisor for Public Access. Uh, I'm here today representing NSF together with my colleague Plato Smith. You want to wave your hand back there, Plato? Another program officer at NSF. And together we're sort of a, a central core of the NSF Public Access Initiative. This session uh, is, we thought that we what we would do with this session to sort of illustrate um, concretely what the program has, has led to while the uh, NSF program is uh, the sum of all the programmatic agency responses to the national need for publicly funded research outputs to be made publicly accessible. Uh, and NSF does, NSF's public access initiative does a lot of things like we run the uh, uh, agency uh, public access repository, the NSF PAR. Um, we do a, a variety of things, but today we wanted to feature awardees from the program over, over the years, some representative and catalytic uh, projects that have been funded. So the public access program supports projects that seek to make the outputs of publicly funded research available to the public, as I said. Over the years, the program has funded 129 projects over the past decade. I looked it up this morning. Um, I don't know, we, we've had, is Beth Playley in the room anywhere? The, hey Beth, uh, another former um, program officer in, in the public access program at NSF. Uh, and at least one of these, I think Bill, you were one of Beth's uh, awardees, maybe in the, somewhere in the past, I don't know. The, the program has long and storied history, so that's wonderful. Um, the, the program makes a lot of awards in any given year. Uh, this year, in 23, we made 10 catalytic awards. This was a particular focus to try to catalyze change through key change agent projects. Uh, I'm not going to go through this list of 10, but we have one of them represented here, the SMART DMSP project um, that you'll hear about. Uh, we wanted, in this panel, to give you a perspective on the, prog on the projects that have been awarded over it over the years. So we have sort of a mix of, uh, of projects like the PASS program that you're going to hear from that are farther back in the program's history, as well as two representative uh, projects from this large program that we competed last year in 2022 that you may have heard about, the Pharos RCN program, long acronym mouthful, the Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, Reusable, Open Science Research Coordination Networks, uh, a particular genre of awards that NSF makes. And you will hear about what kinds of activities uh, RCNs, uh, NSF RCNs do, and with the specific focus on FAIR uh, data principles and uh, open science more broadly. So with that, uh, we're going to tee it up first with a presentation by one of our uh, Pharos projects. So we'll have Kathleen up first. Take it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, and thank you for including us in this, in this project, in this panel. Um, I'm super excited to be able to be here today representing a broadly cross-disciplinary team um, working on a project called STEM Ed Plus Commons, um, which we refer to as a Fair Care OS RCN, um, which I will talk more about as we go. Um, we were one of the grantees in that first round of Pharos RCN funding, um, and we're, we're really seeking to build a network of STEM education researchers, um, as well as a platform to support their work um, and to help them facilitate more and better open collaboration among them. So 
Our proposal originally referred to the project as Deber Plus Commons um, under erasure here. Um, if you go looking for us in the NSF database, you're going to need that term in order to find the grant. Um, but um, we rapidly figured out as we started the community-oriented work in pulling this RCN together um, that Deber or discipline-based education research wasn't a term with which a lot of the folks that we were trying to bring together really identified. Um, and it didn't adequately address the core goal of the project, which is really to get post-secondary education research in STEM fields out of their disciplinary silos. Um, right now, crucial research is being done within physics education or bioscience education or math education or so, and so on, but it isn't really known outside of those communities. And so their researchers end up reinventing the wheel on a lot of their projects. Um, research communities are unable to learn from one another or to build on one another's results, and this ends up resulting in a lot of duplication of effort. So one key goal for our project then is to move from these many isolated STEM education, education research fields to one complex STEM ed plus community um, that can really result in better interdisciplinary research coordination. Now, one challenge in creating this coordination, though, is that these fields operate with widely varying and often poorly applied metadata standards um, and standards for things like data access and reporting principles and so on. And as a result, bringing these fields together is not just a matter of building a platform or gathering the people who make up the research coordination network, but rather requires developing collective agreements and even more importantly, researcher buy-in um, that will help standardize the, the dissemination and preservation of their work. Um, moreover, because much of the data that's generated by STEM education research is qualitative rather than quantitative in nature, and because the researchers who produce Produce those data often feel quite proprietary about it. Um, there hasn't, to this point, been a strong commitment to public access um, to the, that particular product of research. Um, the existing platforms that disseminate the products of research within STEM education fields tend to focus on publications, um, but education researchers produce a wide range of other kinds of research outputs, including data, of course, but also including um, project materials that would benefit from circulation and that our um, RCN needs to be able to support. Even more, um, living up to the Pharos label for our RCN is going to require significant community engagement um, in order, for instance, to develop the collective norms and assumptions regarding means of ensuring that the data that are shared are shared with the highest concern for the privacy and security of the communities involved in the research projects. Developing those norms will require not just a commitment to making data findable, accessible, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but will also require a commitment to the principles of care as well, right? ensuring that um, the data shared are used for the collective benefit of the communities that are being studied, um, that research subjects, including students, have the authority to control how data about them are being used, that researchers exercise appropriate responsibility in their engagements with and support for the communities with which they work, and that community ethics are brought to bear in ways that limit harm and maximize benefit. So in considering how to build such a network and how to establish the shared values and principles um, that it requires, the project leads within the STEM ed fields turn to a seemingly unlikely partner, um, Humanities Commons. Now, Humanities Commons was originally launched in 2016 by a team at the Modern Language Association um, in order to provide a means for scholars and practitioners across humanities fields um, to share their work with one another 
together to develop new collaborations and more. Um, we built this network specifically for the humanities in large part because our fields were technologically underserved. Um, while there were a range of platforms that folks on our end of campus could use to share their work, few of those researchers recognized themselves as having a place on those platforms. And so their communities just simply didn't grow. But by creating a network of networks that provided a range of professional organizations and institutions in the humanities with spaces to cultivate interactions among their members um, alongside an open access free of charge space that any interested person could join. Humanities Commons developed a strong and growing interdisciplinary community. Um, we currently have somewhere in the vicinity of 52,000 members worldwide um, who are using our network to build free and ad free WordPress websites um, to develop rich professional profiles um, to deposit and share work through the Commons repository and more. Now, over the last few years, um, we started noticing a growing number of Commons users who were not in the humanities at all. Right, but we're nonetheless attracted to our program um, and to our platform, um, despite being social scientists or even STEM researchers, um, because they recognize that the, our combination of the repository with the social networking capabilities that the Commons provides allows them to develop their own communities on the platform um, and to ensure that, that the work that they most want to get out to the world is able to reach them. And moreover, because we're a scholar-built nonprofit platform, um, working toward transparency in all of our technological, financial, and governance processes, we provide a trusted space for researchers who want to um, work in public but are unhappy with the extractive nature of most corporate-owned, um, free-of-charge platforms. So the Humanities Commons team has partnered with this collective of STEM education researchers in order to develop STEM Ed Plus Commons. This is um, a diagram with a whole lot of very tiny text on it, which I would be happy to share um, if any of you are interested. Um, this was a diagram that we used in our uh, proposal to talk about the affordances of the network that are currently, that, that were already in place, and then the affordances that we were going to need to develop develop as part of this project. Um, the STEM Ed Plus Commons is going to provide all of the features and functionality of the existing commons, and it will support the new community's processes of developing its own standards and practices. Um, but because those researchers coming to us from STEM fields are likely to bring with them a range of different assumptions and requirements um, about disseminating their work than our humanities-based members thus far have had. Um, we're in the process of making some really significant transformations to the, the network stack itself. Um, we are shifting from our present Fedora-based repository stack um, to an Invenio RDM stack, which is going to allow us to ingest more and different kinds of um, information and data sets and other products. Um, it's gonna allow us to, to um, support the deposit and sharing of complex multi-file projects. It's going to allow those projects to be versioned. It's gonna enable integration with things like GitHub um, and more. And all of this will create opportunities for new kinds of engagement and exchange for all of the Commons members, um, including connection to open and peer review platforms and the development of new kinds of overlay pu uh, publications, which we hope will be coming. However, um, while the technical affordances of a research platform like ours matter enormously, um, building and sustaining its social infrastructure is in many ways more challenging and more important to the project's success. 
So this first iteration of the New Commons repository, for instance, will soft launch in late spring, um, but the STEM Ed Plus community engagement team is currently conducting interviews and is doing focus groups and more kinds of outreach with leaders in education research to find out more about their needs, to check in with them on the process of development that we're working through, and to develop the collective understanding that's necessary for more open data sharing sharing, as well as for developing a set of shared best practices around discoverability and privacy and so on. Now, as for Humanities Commons, um, uh, Santi, if you're in here, this is the diagram that I was talking about at lunch. Um, we're um, in the process of rebranding right now in a way that will allow us to be more clearly seen as a home for interdisciplinary work, um, for a wide range of organizations, institutions, and research networks that are grounded in openness, transparency, and community governance that want to join and support the building of this network. And in addition to developing that community, we're also working on re-architecting the technical um, core of the network, working toward a more federated, distributed network of networks within the commons um, that use the activity pub protocol to support cross-instance communication. So we're really grateful to the NSF um, and to the STEM education community for giving us this opportunity um, to really rethink how our network can function within a broadly interdisciplinary and evolving um, research space. So thank you very much. Our next presenter uh, is our first presenter from John's, of the two projects uh, unrelated at Johns Hopkins. And let me see if we can get our slides up. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Martin mentioned, I'm Bill Brannon at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm going to be speaking about the Public Access Submission System, or PASS, uh, which has a purpose, really, of reducing the burden on researchers as they seek to comply with policies that are either Im imposed by funders or imposed by their institutions around public access, open access. and the project really seeks to do this by simplifying that process of depositing content. And it simplifies this process by defining what a workflow should be and doing the work in the background to capture all the information that's necessary to kind of step into that workflow. So journals, grants, publications, metadata, policies, other things as well. And pulls that together to place it in front of researchers to allow them to make selections, input the appropriate information, only that's what's necessary, and move on with the process as simply as possible. So PASS provides a workflow that is a step-by-step -step, uh, process that gives researchers uh, all of the information they need right when they need it, and allows for deposit into multiple uh, repository systems, so agency repositories, institutional repositories, and seeks to track the outcomes of those in order to enable uh, researchers to see where they are in that process and, and what the outcome is. And really the intention here is for the system to be extensible, to allow for a greater number of deposit types, a greater number of deposit systems, a greater number of input for data, so that a broad range of institutions can come to this application and say, this is going to fit within the context of my university and provide value to the, the researchers that are doing great work within our context. So the background here is that PASS started as a project a collaboration between JHU, Harvard, and MIT back in 2019, and we were really kick-started in large part by an NSF Eager Award at that time that allowed us to really investigate what are the mechanisms that are required to handle deposit in a consistent and uh, uh, applicable way to uh, to all of these different systems, applications that we, where we might want to push data. So the result of that award was a specification called the bag end, uh, the bag it enabled deposit, and yes, some of the folks uh, on, on the group were uh, Tolkien fans. Um, 
And, and the purpose of that was to kind of separate the mechanism for handling the deposit itself and the packaging for, the, for that deposit. So this set us up for having the conversation about if we need to move uh, manuscript data from the researcher's hands into a repository system, what is the, the structure for that? How do we capture it and, and pass it? And how, how do we actually take those steps to, to go from uh, point A to point B and ensure that it arrives in the right place at the right time? So over the last two years, we've been embarking on a, a significant modernization effort of the PASS application. Uh, in the last slide, I mentioned that that kind of first round happened uh, ending in, in 2021, and then there was this thing called COVID. And, uh, and then in 2022, we, we picked this back up and said, this is something that we want to see utilized, not just at Hopkins, where it was deployed at the time, but by a, a number of, large, uh, of other institutions that have the same problem. We keep hearing from others that this is something that is a challenge across the board. And how do we set up an application so that we're in a place that others can use it and we can move forward with this for, for Hopkins as well? So I'm not gonna read through all of the things on this slide, but I, I, a few things to, to point out. There, there was a significant amount of work done in replacing the, the back end as recognition that the PASS system is not intending to be a repository itself. It really is intending to be a workflow system that allows for moving content from one place to another with repositories on the back end that have their own expectations. So removing anything that was unnecessary to simplify the process, simplify the system, make this something that is as extensible as possible so that we can move in a direction of allowing other institutions to plug in their repositories, plug in the data sets and the data flows and the systems that they already have in place so that we can move this into a, a broadly adopted system. One thing I will also call out here is as part of this process, we adopted uh, both uh, some new open source processes. PASS was, has always been open source, but we are now collaborating with uh, the Eclipse Foundation to really move into a, again, modern uh, uh, context of open source, ensuring that we have solid governance and, and the, the kinds of structure that's necessary to work with a collaborative group. A second of three major initiatives over the last three years for the PASS project, uh, the first being a significant development effort, a second being moving into production with this new version of the PASS application. So we did a reboot uh, of the application deployment at Johns Hopkins, working with a, a, a large number of folks in a working group in, in the libraries to build out a new website, a new user guide, a new FAQ, walkthrough videos, all the things you would expect when a new application is being deployed in a university context. But I don't call this out to say, look at the fantastic things we have at Hopkins. It's more about PASS is being set up to have a series of resources that are available to be used, both the software as, as well as these other resources that allow people to see how can I use this, where's the value, how do I connect to this within my own institution. So these are all resources that are expected to be utilized, repurposed for the purpose of, uh, of using PASS in other institutions. If you'd like to see what that looks like, you can go to pass.jhu.edu. And so as one example of the uh, resources that was created as we were working towards talking about PASS within the, the Hopkins context with it was this slide that allows us to just walk through some of the values and benefits that PASS brings to the table for the institutional uh, researchers that are looking to handle and submit uh, their manuscripts through PASS into either our institutional repository or uh, the NIH manuscript system, which leads to PubMed. This, the, uh, third part of the, the three initiatives that occurred over the past year was uh, working together with a series of other institutions that are like-minded in seeing uh, PASS be utilized within their institution for the submission of, of, these, of this manuscript data into repository systems. So the list here, you can see Caltech, uh, Lyricist, uh, NCAR, Tind, University of Louisville, Oregon, Rochester, and Virginia. And I'll call out here that we have uh, both five 
uh, universities as well as a, a research uh, group as well as two um, organizations that handle and manage hosting. So we are very intentional about choosing institutions of varying sizes and uh, that use different kinds of systems so that we can try to understand what the capabilities are in different places and look to fit pass into as much as possible all of those scenarios. And also working with TIND and with Lyricist to understand what are the requirements for moving pass into being a hosted platform. So not just something that is expected to be run by a system, set of systems engineers at a, you know, at a large institution, but can be utilized in smaller institutions as well. So looking ahead, again, we have a three-part initiative. Uh, the first of those is to really focus on federal agency deposit. So we've been in touch with, with Martin, of course, and others at NSF and DOE, and really want to move forward towards an automated deposit capability in that context. We see a, a real need for that, uh, not just at NSF, but across the spectrum of agencies, and would like to work with a number of them NSF is, of course, uh, a, a major goal because so many of the institutions represented here have funding from, from NSF. We would also like to ensure that we have a consistent and modular system for capturing information about grants at every institution that we can bring into PASS so that there is a consistent uh, method for pulling the data and information that PASS needs to function uh, into the system so that then it can be utilized. What we discovered in our series of conversations over the last six months was that there's a huge variety and there's very little consistency in the way grant data is managed across institutions. So looking for something right now that is <clears throat> as generic as possible. And the third being working towards additional uh, deposit uh, repositories at institutions. So we have a number of these represented by the groups and we're very excited uh, to move towards having a larger number of institutional repositories that can be part of the PASS system. Um, I had a great conversation with, with folks at Caltech yesterday about uh, potentially integrating with the NVIDIA RDM system that they are utilizing. So that seems like a, a fantastic next, next step. So as I wrap up, I just want to say thank you uh, to, to NSF for really kickstarting this project and allowing us to make all of this progress over, over this time. So thank you. So our third presenter is um, John Chidaki from California Digital Library. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be dis uh, talking today about machine actionable DMPs. Um, the project that we're working on with NSF support is called Smart DMSP. Um, it's really an uh, experimentation uh, project that's thinking about piloting different approaches and streamlining the way that we're capturing metadata and, and pulling information from data management plans and dis discriminate, di distributing demonstrating, sorry, demonstrating the value of that to um, our communities. Uh, the, the PI for this is Maria Pretzelis, so I'm representing her today. She wasn't able to make it. Um, she and I both work at the California Digital Library on a team called UC3, the UC Curation Center that's focused on these issues around research data management, persistent identifiers, digital preservation. Um, and we have several um, partners that we're working on on this project. Um, CDL is the, is the main group um, working, but we have partners at ARL and at DataSite that are also sub-awards on this work, so it's, it's, a, it's definitely a team effort. Um, so what is a machine actionable data management plan or a data management and sharing plan? Um, it is, just in very clear terms, as taking what we know of as a data management plan and, and structuring it. So really thinking of this technically, you can think of it as, you know, JSON formatted information that is common when people are doing planning on projects. Um, the reason why people are interested in this and why we are working on this project is because we want to really enable all of the systems and su research supporting systems and people in our ecosystem to leverage the really robust and, and meaningful information that's captured in these documents. 
and making sure not only that they're available to machines and people um, in real time, but also that they become really what we've always wanted uh, DMPs to be, which is living documents that get uh, versioned and changed over time. And so the project that we're working on is really thinking about how we, um, we, can, we can get there with, um, within uh, systems and tools. So why are we talking about this now? I mean, obviously, I'm sure everybody here knows there's a lot of policy discussion happening right now around what is changing not only in federal agencies, but then the trickle-down effects of those into our institutions and into research and this, this journey that we're on of seeing where the current policy landscape is going to take us is definitely something that has influenced the work that we have here in this, this grant project, but also the work that we're doing in general with machine actionable DMPs. And again, we as institutions are regularly looking at not only how we can track our outputs for our own understanding and looking at our own uh, in investments and in our own um, impact within our communities, but also tracking um, is important for us to be able to showcase compliance and our conversations with funders like the like federal agencies. And so with all of this kind of uh, in mind, the the time for the project that we are working on is you know it's it's very it is very timely. Um, it is also uh, because we want to fil facilitate um, change. We want to make it so that uh, information about research projects is more easily retrievable. We want to create systems that are based off of primary sources of the researchers' plan. Um, to understand and be, and, and, and be notified and to verify what's going on in research. Um, many of us will know that it's, you know, if, if we told our non-institution-based friends that we at institutions don't really know what's going on in research labs across the campuses, they'd be amazed because they assume we know this information and we should know it and we do have access to many documents that would inform and it's time for us to be able to retrieve that and, and build that into our systems. And so this is kind of what we're trying to do is facilitate that change. So getting into the, the very you know, nitty gritty of, of what we've, we are building towards. <clears throat> At California Digital Library, we run a project called DMP Tool that many of you use and leverage on your campuses. Um, that is just one of many uh, data management tools and is, that are out there in the world. Um, here's a series of logos that we uh, work with. Um, it is a community of people who have built systems in this space. Um, and one of the challenges that we started tackling about five years ago is, okay, as we're moving towards this machine actionable DMP world, well, what is that JSON format? What is that structure? What is that markup gonna be? And we launched a RDA working group, uh, of what we call the common standards for data management plans, and came out with a published uh, standard for people to use when they're interchanging information that one would find in a data management plan. And so this is something that I, is maybe one of the key takeaways maybe is um, in the conversations that we have in this space, we, we do regularly talk about how there are more people working on different things and wondering if they're competing or cooperating. And maybe one takeaway is that all of these logos cooperate. We talk all the time. The common standard is something we co-developed and all of our systems are being retooled right now to leverage the same standard. So this is something that it's important for you as part of the community to understand that we are actually on the same page. This is not a, this is not a competition. Um, but what is, in that markup, like what is it that we're, we're tracking? And I, it, 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 it is the information that you would assume. It is what are the data types that are coming out of research? What are the tools and softwares that are being used? What are the standards for those systems and tools and outputs that researchers are creating? What is their preservation and access plan? And then what is the oversight over time? I think these are the main components that you'll find if you go into the markup and the structures of this exchange format that we've created. And really the idea is that with that exchange format, you can start to build integrations to facilitate guidance, which many of you use um, DMP tool now as a way to create uh, a discussion with your researchers on your campus. 
Um, that same kind of guidance can be optimized and streamlined with integrations with the machine actionable DMPs um, to, as I said before, compliance, but also around promoting research integrity and really being able to understand and, and see what is being created so we can track the impact of research. So what integrations are we working on? Um, with this project, uh, we, have, we, are, we have taken uh, the DMP tool um, and restructured the backend system to use that common standard as the, the basic structure that all DMPs that are created within DMP tool um, get done. <laughs> um, it, we're, we're using that standard as the, the, the kind of database fields that we're using to store and leverage and create um, the systems and the, the, the structures for data management plans right now. So what we're doing with this project is um, taking those, that structure and, and looking to um, integrate it into key systems in, in, in a campus setting and in a research setting. So looking at structures for RIMS systems and looking at the best way to get into electric, uh, electronic lab notebooks and just kind of thinking about what are the main stakeholders and you know, computational environments and these types of things. Also looking at ways that grants databases are leveraging and managing systems and information so that things can be up to date and as I was talking about before, notifications and verification can take place. We have um, started prototyping out work right now. If you are a DMP tool member or, you, or user, you can go and you can see we've started prototyping out what landing pages would look like. I mean, what we're really trying to do here is have the information that is in data management plan be as public as possible. So we have a lot of controls on privacy, but we want to make sure there are ways for people to actually use persistent identifiers to resolve to a landing page to see what are the outputs from projects. And so this is an example where, you know, a, a, a grant project or uh, that, that had a DMP, um, you know, it has a landing page, it has a place for people to go and as outputs that are tracked, that are found, that have been published out, if it's journal articles or data sets or protocols or software, that they are listed at the bottom of this kind of a page. And you can see these kind of, this kind of prototyping happening right now if you're, if you're in the DMP tool. Um, and also, obviously, integrations um, require APIs. So, I mean, we are spending a lot of the time and energy with this, this, this project to, to integrate with systems through our API. And so, we actually have our API um, well documented if you can think of systems that would be good integration partners if you have ideas or if you have somebody on your team or you would be interested in looking in. The way that we're integrating through the technical side of things, please feel free to, to jump over to our API documentation. And really, um, you know, what, we, what we're doing here is trying to think about how we can pilot this, these systems on campuses. And we at CDL received us an award um, from IMLS recently, and so we've been combining those resources and those, those planning to um, work uh, across the two awards um, on the idea of piloting with institutions. Um, as I mentioned before, we're partnering with Datasite on, f on the development of how to use persistent identifiers and DMP IDs. We are working with ARL on staffing um, uh, support for helping with these pilots and really trying to make sure that we are connecting systems as much as possible, and we're exploring with the community how this new data model um, for the common standard for, for data management plans can be leveraged. And as, as all of us are, you know, we are definitely looking at, as a key component of this project, to leverage machine learning on what is that researchers are trying to convey with their plans and how we can make the whole process much more streamlined and understandable to them. That's it. Our last presenter is also from Johns Hopkins, um, David Elbert, a materials scientist, and I'll say his MARTA project, I'll embarrass him again by relating that uh, it has the distinction of um, the single most largest number of peer-reviewed papers generated in the NSF public access repository of any project in NSF history. So. 
Thank you, Martin. That's probably not true, but <laughs> we'll, we'll move on. And if it is, it's only true because of my collaborators. So <laughs> let's see if we can make the slideshow start. What's going on? Can you just hit from the beginning or presenter or anything? We will get you going. There you Beautiful. Go. Thank you. So as Martin said, I'm here, I'm David, I'm here to represent uh, one of the RCNs in material science. And I want to say that um, an important part of this panel is this idea of catalyzing broader use of data central to uh, addressing the types of things that are important in different domains. Uh, for us in the materials world, there are really these sort of fundamental materials problems we work on, figuring out how a material, a metal, a ceramic, a polymer works, and then expanding knowledge of how we might advance new designs or novel discoveries and use things like AIML to uh, accelerate that. The Venn diagram here is a perception I have of the way workflows are. We talk a lot about workflows, um, and there are really three different kinds of workflows that a lot of people I work with don't recognize. They're focused on their own. And for us, we have lab data production, the place where data is produced in experiments or modeling. We have data analysis and visualization. There are different workflow tools that you might use there. Um, and then data curation and um, sharing of information that would be yet another type of workflow that we have to uh, deal with. So data is growing exponentially in the materials world and our main framing is something called the Materials Genome Initiative, the MGI, which came um, out of the Obama White House about a dozen years ago now and uh, is administered out of Office of Science, Technology and Policy in the White House. Um, on the left is a graph that shows we have sort of an inflection point of this exponential growth um, in digital use and, and uh, data use around the time the MGI formed. Um, but I want to emphasize that the growth in data use doesn't necessarily correlate to a growth in data understanding or access. This is still mostly people working with data they're creating mostly in their own projects. The figures on the right are sort of the overall views from the early MGI strategic plan on top and the most recent one, what we call MGI 2.0 on the bottom. And really the point there is to show you that there's always been this idea that there are a lot of things that are interrelated and threads that connect but how do we actually connect them and make those things work? The science data landscape is changing. We're automating everything. We have high throughput in our labs. If we take automation and combine it with decisions, we have this opportunity to move towards autonomy, something that might be called self-driving labs, although Clifford Lynch took issue with that term um, in his opening remarks. It's a term that's out there. It's evocative and the community likes it. But a real key here is that linked data is uh, absolutely important to be able to look at the entire history of what we do across the entire research landscape, not just packaging up some fair release of data that's associated with the figures in the publication we came out with last week. The problem we find is that scientists are like the worst judges ever of the reuse of their own data. The science is a little bit myopic. We tend to work on a lot of different stuff that's very difficult. We have uh, increasing fire hose of data. We have great new detectors, big facilities. We have fast data, faster than ever, bigger variety of data, larger amounts of data, and we collect it in a much more distributed research enterprise than we ever did before. The same graduate student will go to the synchrotron that works on the TEM downstairs in the lab that does something in a, a thin film deposition type place. So we get a little myopic. These techniques are hard. People have to learn how to do them, and they really don't have time to see the whole forest sometimes for the trees. And so we have worked hard at building community efforts to try to link together data stakeholders that go just beyond the R&D people or the researchers in the labs. And the figure on the right is a somewhat fanciful representation of one way to define a bunch of stakeholders, the computational facilities, the labs, the PIs, the publishers, the repositories, the libraries, all these types of people who have some relationship to materials data that we need to network together. And uh, MARTA, Materials Research Data Alliance, formed um, about five years ago now. We're coming up on our fourth annual meeting in February. Big plug. Everyone should go. It's free. It's online. We'll talk about it later. Um, and then we have a new Martian, the Materials Research Coordination Network, which is the major effort under MARTA to actually fund some things and make some things happen. And the most important part, I think, of the way we have pushed these issues out 
are actually encompassed and, and, and incorporated in MGI 2.0 where we are goal one, objective two, to establish a national materials data network. In other words, people are infrastructure too. It's not just software and hardware. In fact, maybe people are the most important infrastructure. And so I just wanna emphasize that it is a grassroots, community-driven effort. We have everybody voting with their time and they're all volunteers. We have over 350 members now and it grows. Um, but the idea is that we also have a governance council that helps make things actually work, who volunteer a little more time to get things going, and who are liaisons to funders and policymakers, because there's quite a disconnect between people doing the work and people sitting at meetings like this or at the RDA or other places. And I really want to emphasize some of these people in particular, the photos on the right are the members of the Governance Council right now, who are all brilliant in their own fields, but they're also brilliant at putting the time into understanding what other people are doing and networking people together. Annual meeting, third week of February, Tuesday through Thursday, half day virtual online, martaalliance.org. You'll find the information you need. So Martian, our research coordination network is one that is a subset of that council, some people who came together to try to um, start working towards sustainability of this organization by actually pushing more outputs out and helping to guide things a little bit. We're rather distributed both in location, although, sorry, Pacific time zone, we don't have anyone there yet. We have members and members on our councils, but not on this particular award. We have a focus on um, some education in MSIs and the like, and we really sort of work in four different areas, fair data, fair models and workflows, fair training, which is a workforce development that really is focused on MSIs at this point in time, and then fair impact, because we really think that it's important that the um, impacts evolve as the work is done in these volunteer working groups, right? We don't wanna have people have one end game because the target is always changing, so it has to work, and you need to include people and roll out impacts as you go rather than wait for a final report and then shop it around looking for someone to do something. We work with a lot of meetings of various types. There are two listed there on the right, working towards metadata in something that's high value in the materials world, uh, electron microscopy metadata, almost everyone does electron on microscopy of one sort or another and has laboratory management to do. So we have virtual meetings, we have in-person meetings, and we're experimenting with a number of different things, doing only virtual things, bringing people together, actually paying for travel and getting people where we need them to go to try to incentivize it. I want to emphasize three impacts in different working groups that have come out of this. Um, the first one um, is uh, a roadmap that's come out as a perspective publication piece in MRS, Materials Research Society, bulletin. Um, and this one, I think, is interesting because it's different than a lot of roadmaps. There are a lot of things written about data and data in the materials world. Um, here, what we tried to do is simplify things, keep it small, and give people at all different levels. You know, there's a um, research data cycle. People think of, of, the, of, the, of the life cycle of research data, and there are places along it. There's also a life cycle for the researchers that are involved and the people who are the stakeholders. They are at their own place along that, and you can't simply say, well, here, comply, meet some checklist, become fair, do all these things. You need to meet people where they are. So across the top on that roadmap, we have individual things that people can do from very simple, level one, level two, level three. They can do that in their own lab. They can participate that in a bigger organization. And then when we have what we have envisioned as community, things that people can work on together, like targeted high-value data sets, um, software, and the like. Second working group that's been kind of brilliant for us um, has been one that came out of our annual meeting uh, uh, two years ago where there was a lot of talk about metadata extraction. Most of us automate metadata extraction. Metadata entry forms are where science goes to die. Nobody wants any more of those than needed. And so we're producing digital data, so we might as well take the header of the file and get what we can get out of it. Um, and so we were all doing that, and we thought, why are we all doing that when we have the same instruments? So what we've done, and really it's the brilliance of Matthew Evans at Louvain, it quickly became an international project, and Peter Krauss at Berlin, and we created a system where it's basically sort of a, a layer with an API, a schema, and a registry. And this now is coded up, and so with a simple YAML, you can decide, or you can describe what the metadata in the header of your X-ray diffraction uh, instrument or your scanning electron microscope looks like, or so on and so forth, and we can share those things openly, and this will roll out in the next month or so. 
and then one that's been exciting to a lot of people because there's a, uh, uh, the numbers are impressive. Everybody's very excited in the last year about large language models. Everybody's buzzing about ChatGPT, and especially early in the year, people didn't quite know what to make of it. There have been sessions here teaching us more. And so Ben Blazik, who's one of our co-PIs, brought some friends together to organize a hackathon, an online hackathon. And the outcomes here were really interesting. We had a lot of people participating because it's popular and was fully virtual, so it was easy to do. Um, we had submissions, and then we had um, 10 that really submissions that really went farther. I think the thing that blows people away is that we had more than 1.2 million views on social media, and that's really the brilliance in this case of Ben Blazik for saying all the submissions have to come in on social media, and you tag them with the hashtag for Marta, and you tag them with hashtag LLM. And like in March, if you put hashtag LLM on anything, you got a million views within a week because everybody thought they were going to just change the world for them. But it's important because it like gets the word out and it builds our community and it lets people come in and see the different kinds of things we can do and of course they um, continue to be important. I'm going to switch gears really quickly and talk a little bit about um, some of the science that I do in my own group and is in, in, uh, important across the community and this type of work of building the community catalyzes. The MGI diagram shows this loose idea and everybody puts up a graph schematic of how all these different types of data connect. So this is um, Gannon uh, Murray who was an REU working with me this last summer, an undergraduate at Earlham College. And I think what was really interesting is we work at all levels when we build community, right? And so Gannon came in to synthesize some things, in this case orthovanidates, yttrium orthovanidates, which is a laser crystal and hard to make in great purity. And so we had him work simultaneously in the lab learning how to synthesize things and try new things with coding up a graphical data model that we use called GEM that was developed at Citrine Informatics and uh, I worked on some of the early stages of, which really works in terms of the currency that material science work with. We have materials, they become ingredients, we put them through processes and then we characterize them and then we take that material and it might go on through the cycle to do something else. And so Gannon was able to not only learn to make things, but code up a graphical model of it in a Python notebook and associate PIDs with everything that was used in it. And the beauty of that is not just that he came up with a model that made sense, and this is Gannon's slide, and it's one of the most exciting slides I have, and I, I, he used this and came up with it completely on his own in his final presentation, and so I love it. Um, and he said, look, I did these syntheses, and now I can query them, I can look, I can see relationships to them. But what really becomes important and exciting is when not only I do this, but when the whole community does this, because now it totally changes how we do the science. Because now we not only see a full material history from the conception of making something through the steps of making that thing to the way that we characterize it and the properties that it has. So scientists live in a forest that they've never seen. But once we start connecting their data across the entire enterprise, we start to make the invisible visible. We've taken this further into full project data. The graph on the right has about 8,000 links in it, but we have some that go over 30,000 links. And then it becomes a really cool visualization problem, right? It looks nice as a cloud, but we can actually think in terms of all those processes just like Gannon did. And we're rolling out tools to do that sort of thing. And of course, it only works when we have the whole community involved. So three things I want to leave you with on this really quickly. Um, there are a lot of things on here. There are the different workflows, and I highlighted in yellow, public access and open science are not obvious objectives in many sciences where IP is involved. And in the materials world, people want to make stuff, they want to patent it, they want to make money off it, and industry wants to roll it out. So it's tricky to build that community, but public access and open science are absolutely fundamental to the transformative advances in the field. And projects like the RCN and the other work that are done with public access at NSF really focus on tools, but also now people. So that's critical to catalyzing this kind of work. And with that, I think we're all done, and we thank you, and we'll take questions from the panel. Thanks. this on? There we go. I want to thank all our presenters um, for their great work and uh, provocative activities. Tom, do you have a yeah, question? I do. Did I, am I doing this right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Bill, I 
familiar with PASS, and we've, we've talked before, I got the core notion that it was a way from one deposit to put it in many places. Today, I also got the sense that it is, there is a link to grant um, compliance monitoring and traffic with a grant management system. Could you say a little bit more, am I getting that right, and could you say a little bit more? And then also, with OSTP coming and the mandated deposits to the federal, what seem to be the federally designated repositories for articles, are you expecting any of the physics or the drivers around PASS to change? Thanks, Thanks Tom. Uh, so as part of the conversations that we've had over the past year with, with a number of institutions, it's become really clear that there's a lot of interest in the compliance aspect of what PASS can do and recognizing that as you have a, a greater number of, of your researchers moving through a single system to, to handle deposit, there's a, a greater opportunity to understand from a compliance standpoint, what does that mean, what does that look like? So that's not something that's really built into PASS right at this moment, but it's, it's a recognition that that's something that PASS enables. And, and so we're, we're looking to how do we move that into in a direction of ensuring that we're we're utilizing that data appropriately and usefully and providing it in, in a way that makes it something that actually can be used in that, in that way for, for considering compliance, understanding you know, from the research administration's perspective what that looks like. I think to, to the second part of your question, I think there's a lot more to be determined around how, what that's going to look like and a lot more discussions to be had. So I, you know, certainly there's opportunity to, to speculate there, but Moving, moving in this direction feels like the the right way, considering that there's a lot of interest in that in that model. If there aren't questions, I have a question for um, at least our two uh, RCN awardees here. Uh, that ha it has been interesting to observe the interactions of all the RCNs in the monthly calls that we've hosted for a while and um, other sort of uh, inter or between project um, communications. Do you, do you want to comment on that just from your perspective? I'm interested in any comments that you might have on that. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to comment on that. First of all, uh, like everyone else, Martin, when you put another meeting on my calendar, I thought, oh, but it's been a great meeting, actually, because um, for those who haven't looked at the list of the other RCNs, um, they cover a range of things, and some you know you will overlap with. Like there's one on PIDs for instruments and facilities. I've been to their workshops, and uh, we already link in and have started minting PIDs for things that we just wouldn't have gotten around to or thought of, and I learned about things. But then there are things like Kathleen's project and others that are not natural overlap, perhaps, from what we would think. And it turns out there's tons of overlap because there is uh, um, a lot of commonality in the issues we face. Um, you know, I've asked Kathleen specifically in the humanities. I, I knew that in my field, proprietary information and stuff was going to be really big. But I didn't know that in the humanities, people would feel ownership over their data in the same ways. And so we don't necessarily find the same solutions. Uh, but we commiserate, and then eventually I think we find common ground. So I think it's been really helpful from my perspective. Yeah, I think that has been extremely helpful, and it's also been really great to see um, the the wide range of interpretations of um, both of the, the coming together of FAIR Open Science and the research coordination networks, um, to think about how those components come together um, and how these projects might interoperate and, and mutually support as we go forward. So it's been a great opportunity to be in contact um, with those other projects. Um, are there any questions for anybody on the panel or about the uh, public access program in general? And if not, we can give you a few minutes back before the uh, break. So thank you all for attending, and uh, we, uh, I, I want to thank our panelists again. Good job, folks. <laughs>